In Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 and 32, it says, The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors, when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though I loved them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. So the Lord says right here he's going to make a new covenant. The old covenant, the Jews messed up. They didn't follow it very well. But pretty much what he's saying is that the old system, the people didn't keep it. The old covenant. And what was going to happen now was a better blood sacrifice. These animals, they didn't volunteer to die for our sins, did they? No. The high priest was, was an imperfect man. When he went in there, like Moses, he was the high priest. But all the ones after him, they were imperfect men. And like I said, they were sinners just like us. The tabernacle was a tent, which later became a temple that Solomon built, King David's son. And there were all the animals sacrificed. They took place in that temple. The new priest will never die. See, all these other priests had to die. He will always be there to go to the Father for us. Amen. I know who you, I know y'all know who I'm talking about, but this is going to be the new high priest, unlike the priests in the old covenant who would die and we'd have to replace them. It's going to be different. Because of this new covenant, Jesus becoming the high priest, he defeated death and the old tub, the old tabernacle, the old covenant, the old tabernacle was no more when Jesus defeated death. In Matthew chapter 27 verse 50 through 53 then Jesus shouted out again, and he released his spirit. This is when he was on the cross. Verse 51. And at that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two. Now this curtain is talking about the veil. The veil that covered the holies of holies, where nobody could go in there but the high priest. When Jesus gave it the spirit, it said that the, that the temple with the veil was torn from top to bottom. The earth shook rocks split apart and tombs open. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem and appeared to many people. So when Jesus defeated death, that's when the tabernacle itself and the veil where only the high priest could go back there of the holies holies, didn't need that no more. Hmm. Jesus was the high priest and he became the final sacrifice, which we'll get to that. But because of that, the tabernacle was no more. The temple was no more. That's, when, that's why the Bible says, we're the temple of God now. We are, not a building. We, we are the temple. The Holy City of Jerusalem was in heaven. And when Jesus defeated death and resurrected to heaven, it says in Revelation 21.2, And I, John, saw the Holy City... New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride a door for her husband. So this new city that is talking about right here and everybody was got out of the graves and the, the veil was torn, that's because the new Jerusalem, which is in heaven now, started it's it's gonna be here on earth. New Jerusalem, the new heaven will be here on earth. And you'll find that out in the in, in Revelation, but in verse ten of chapter twenty one. It says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. This is God taking John to show him the vision. And showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So like I said, when Jesus rose from the grave and resurrected, we no longer needed the tabernacle. We'll see that Jesus became the high priest also in the scriptures. And that's why all this was able to happen. In Hebrews chapter 6 verses 19 and 20. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Again, it's talking about the veil, the curtain, and this sanctuary is talking about the holies of holies. Verse 20, Jesus has, has already gone in there for us. He has become our, our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now this priest, Melchizedek, there's not, there, we don't know too much about him. He's, he's all of a sudden in the Bible, and then all of a sudden he's gone. They don't say too much about him. But now we have a new and better covenant. Hebrews chapter 8, 
verses 6 through 13. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator, mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. And the reason the first covenant was faultless was because of man. Man ran it. Moses was a man. All those priests were men. Imperfect men. And that's why it was faultless. Because men ran it. Verse 8. For finding fault with them, meaning men, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. So they were not faithful in the covenant they had with God. That's what he's saying right here. So God turned their back on them. He turned their back on Jerusalem because they just weren't faithful to this covenant that God had with them. And in verse 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Now what he's saying here is that he's going to put the Holy Spirit in us. This new covenant that's where the Holy Spirit could, because they didn't have the Holy Spirit didn't come in them in the Old Testament. Right. So He's going to put the Holy Spirit in us now. First, we hear about the Lord, then some of us, some of us will put Him in our heart, and that's when we will receive the Holy Spirit, and He will be our God, and we will be just the people. Do you know how many of us people want to be God? Want to act like we know what we're doing? How many of us know we don't have no common sense? And that we're really not smart without the Lord. We have no wisdom or knowledge without the Lord. How many of us know that? We don't. That's why he said, hey, I just want y'all to be people. Let me be God. Let me take care of everything. Let me have the wisdom. Let me have the knowledge. Let me have the understanding. Let me have all this. You just be people. You just follow me. That's what he's saying right here. Matthew 22, 37. Jesus saith unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Now this is how we become Christians. We love the Lord with all of our heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. That's becoming a Christian. When you give the Lord that. When you give Him 100% of your heart, your soul, and your mind. That's when you become a Christian. He wants 100%. And like I said before, if you only give Him 99%, do you know how much we can do with that 1%? We can do a whole lot with 1%. Oh, well... I gave him 99%, but this 1%, I'm going to keep partying. That's my 1%. I'm going to keep partying or, or keep lying or keep stealing. No. He says, I want all your heart, soul, and my all of it. That's being a Christian. Romans 7, 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. God said, without him, there is no good thing in us. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. We won't find that what is good until we, could, until we find Jesus. Until we put Jesus in the heart. We're not going to find that good. Because like I said, God said, our goodness is as filthy rags to Him. In Titus 3.5, He says, goodness will not get you to heaven. Receiving the Holy Spirit, being washed by the Holy Spirit, that's what gets you to heaven. So the Lord is saying, hey, your goodness is nothing. Don't depend on your goodness. And there's a lot of people out there who, in fact, I was talking to somebody today. We were talking and, and all they kept saying was, you know, well, I do this and I do that. And it's all works, you know, being good. And I told them, that's not going to get you there. That's not going to get you there. This is why he says, I'll be God, you be people. He's saying, what he's saying is quit wanting to be God. And in, in certain ways, that's what we do. When we don't listen to Him, and we think we know a better way, we're, we're, we're being God. we got to let God be God, and we just be people. Well, a lot of us don't know how to do that. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. So even though we don't understand it, 
We need to believe Him and follow Him. Even though we don't understand it, let Him be God. Let Him be God. Verse 11. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more. He's speaking about Christians here. Because he's not going to tell a, a Christian, not going to tell another Christian, you know, know the Lord like they don't know the Lord. So he's talking to Christians here and he says that he will be merciful and forgiving of their sins. And he'll remember them no more. Amen. Amen. Those of us who have sinned in our lives, that's all of us. That's all of us. We ask for forgiveness. He forgives us and he remembers them no more. Now, that's if you ask him from the heart. If you ask him from the heart. The Lord knows if you ask him from the heart. He knows if you're playing a game with him. And he knows when it's coming from the heart. Oh, well, you know, I'm going to go out here and have fun and get drunk, whatever. Uh, and tomorrow I'll ask him to forgive me. No, that's not coming from the heart. That's playing a game with the Lord. You do not want to play games with the Lord. He knows your heart better than you know your heart. He knows my heart better than I know my heart. So you don't play games with the Lord. I wouldn't want to play games with the Lord, okay? He's an almighty God. The Lord has given us mercy to become righteous with Him. He tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things have become new. That's why you can tell when someone becomes a Christian. Because if, if they still act the same, and they tell you, Oh, I'm born again, but they still act the same, they're lying. It's a lie. Because right here, the Lord says, all things become new. Old things have passed away. All things become new. That's what he says. John 4, 12, 14, 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I shall do, shall he do also. So when you become a born again Christian, he said, the Lord says, the works I was doing when I was here on earth, the works I was doing, you'll, you'll do them also. How many of us was doing the work of the Lord before we came to know him? None of us. So you become a new creature. People will see it. Verse 16 of chapter 14. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. And we know that comforter means Holy Spirit. We know that. Jesus lives in our lives. Jesus, not only does he live in our lives, but listen to me. Jesus lives through our lives. He lives through our lives. Depending on how you walk with the Lord, He walks through our lives. If we're walking with the Lord, He's, He's, He's living in us, but He's living through us. Still reaching people through the Holy Spirit, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Because He says we're all witnesses. Everyone who's a born-again Christian is a witness. You're either a good witness or you're a bad witness. But we're all witnesses. In Romans chapter 6, verse 3 through 8, and then verse 11, or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined in Him, His death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Again, there's new lives. Will you become a new Christian? There's no way someone can say, I'm born again, and they keep on living the way they're living. Because I've done read, read several verses here that says you have a new life. Verse 5. Since we have been united with him in, in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. Amen? Amen. We are no longer slaves to sin. How many of us know we were slaves to sin? We were slaves. We had no power whatsoever to fight the devil. None. We were slaves to his sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Amen. 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 I mean, I hope y'all y'all heard that. Verse 11. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. I, you know, I don't see how people cannot want to read the Bible. I read stuff like this and I just get excited. I mean, I do. This is real. 
I mean, this is truth here. Power had, sin had power over me at one time. But the Lord has set me free. Amen? The Lord has set us free. If we allow Him, He will set us free. We will not be a slave to the devil anymore. Amen. Since we died with Jesus, it says we will raise with Him. Amen. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. If you then be risen with Christ, seek. If you're a Christian, this is what it says. Seek those things which are above. Things that are Christ-like. That's what it's talking about. For Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. What's the things on the earth? Running around with your lost buddies. Lying to get ahead. Stealing just to have. That's things of the earth. We should think of things above. And what's above? The Lord. Jesus. That's is what we that's who we live for and that's who we should try to please is the Lord. Quit trying to please people on earth. Trying to be popular in a lost world. If you're popular in a lost world, what's that make you? Lost. lost. There's no way you can be a born again Christian walking in the light and be popular in a lost dark world. It don't go together. Right. Galatians 2.20 My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in Jesus, who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. Amen. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8-11 through 11. Yes, Everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord. For His sake I have discarded everything else. For His sake I have discarded everything else. Everything that used to make me happy, everything that I used to do, that I enjoyed, that was not of the Lord. We're talking about people who were lost. This does not, make, this does, this does not please Him. It says, counting it all as garbage. My life was garbage before I came to know the Lord. That's what it says right here. Counting it, counting it all as garbage. So that I could gain Christ and become one with Him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with Him, Himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that Raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. Words. <laughs> that's what the Lord. That's what the Lord is saying right here. This is us. This should be us. This should be a Christian. Not only being glorified with him when he raised from the dead, but we should also want to suffer in his death. And suffering in his death. What way do we suffer here on earth? On earth for the Lord. We suffer by not wanting not being accepted by people because there's more lost people out there than Christians right. so you know not being accepted that's hard for people they want to be accepted by others but the Lord says no suffer with me remember the world, the world hated me so if we want to be like Christ then the world's going to hate us too right. that's us suffering for the Lord that's okay I'll do all the suffering he wants me to do I do not live to please people. I live to please the Lord. That's it. When he says old things are passed away, he has set us free from the power of sin. He means it. He means that. He is old things have passed away. Old things have passed away. We are set free from the power of sin. Were you a junkie? He's freed you from that. Were you an alcoholic? He has freed you from that. This is what he's talking about. Old things have passed away. And I've said it before, I'll say it again. I, I believe I was an alcoholic because my mama said I was an alcoholic and my best friend said I was an alcoholic, so probably I was an alcoholic. But who set me free from that? Did I go to AA? No, I didn't go to AA. The Lord set me free from that. The Lord did. Was money and having possessions your master? He frees you from that. You no longer live just so you can have material things. Because you want to keep up with the Joneses. He sets you free from that. He says, set your affections on things above, not the things on earth. That's the things on earth. Getting ahead in life, 
That's, that's earthly. That's worldly. That's in the flesh. Look at John the Baptist. You read about John the Baptist. He, he had a walk with the Lord. I mean, he separated himself from everybody else. I was a man of God. What did he eat? Locusts. Where did he live? In the wilderness. But that's what he wanted to do for the Lord. Amen? Amen. He didn't set his things on things of the earth, like material stuff. Whatever sin you was under, he's freed you from that. Maybe these things I just said, maybe that's not what you was under. Maybe you had some other kind of uh, sin that was in your, in your life that you, that you couldn't get away from. He set his freedom on that. All things have become new. All things. All things. What's that all again? All of it. All of what you were doing. Now, not every single thing you was doing was sin, but all the sin you was committing before coming to know the Lord, he says, those things, those sins have passed away. Verse 13. In that he saith, a new covenant he hath made the first O. Now that which decayeth and waxeth O is ready to vanish away. He gave us a new covenant and it's called the New Testament. He gave us a Savior called Jesus, a high priest. He gave us a final sacrifice. These other sacrifices, how many times did they have to do it? In the Holies of Holies, they had to do it once a year. But they did it every day in the outside of the tabernacle. They, the, the, the people had to bring animals to be sacrificed. The new way is Jesus. One sacrifice forever. Not every day, forever. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 through 11. But God showed, which demonstrated, His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were yet sinners. Even while we were still sinners, didn't look to God for nothing, didn't want Him for anything, while we were still that way, God sent His Son. Is that love? Can any of us love like God loves? God has an agape love. And agape love is not a worldly love. Agape love is, is you're, you're, we're reading that right now. Even though we didn't pay Him no attention, even though we gave, him, we gave Him no time whatsoever, He sent His Son to come die for us while we were yet sinners. That's what it says. Verse 9, And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, He will certainly save us from God's wrath. Believe me, God's wrath is coming. For all these people who are enjoying life right now in, in, in the darkness, God's wrath is coming. Verse 10, For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of His Son while we were still His enemies, God called us His enemies. Right here He's calling us His we were his enemies, and he sent his son. We will certainly be saved through the life of his son. Like I said before, we will be saved by his son, not by us trying to be good. Doesn't work. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 9 through 12. This is an illustrating pointing to the present time. For the gifts and sacrifices that the priests offered are not able to be cleansed the, con the conscience of the people who brings them. It was an imperfect cleansing. The Old Testament. We're talking about the Old Covenant, tabernacle, all that sacrificing that was being done, animal sacrificing. It says it was imperfect. Imperfect, imperfect cleansing. The Israelites never really knew if they were forgiven or not. In the tabernacle, they had what they called the scapegoat. The scapegoat was when they would put the sin, the sins, they asked for they would confess their sins, they'd put it on the goat, and then they would let the goat out in the wilderness. They wouldn't kill it, they wouldn't sacrifice it. This is one way of them getting rid of their sins. They would put it on the goat. And this will be more on the tabernacle when I teach on it. But the scapegoat would be lost into the wilderness. And not always what it did stay out there. Sometimes they returned back to the camp. So there was no freedom in the people who did this because they weren't sure if the, uh, if the cleansing was going to take or not. If that sins were going to come back on that scapegoat. So you see how much better we have it now? Really? Amen? Uh -huh. I mean, you compare the old covenant uh -huh. with the new covenant. I'm giving it to you right here. I'm giving you the scriptures. Verse 10. For that old system, talking about the covenant, deals only with food and drink 
and various cleansing ceremonies, physical regulations that were, in, were that were effect only until a better covenant could be established. That was only for temporary. That was just a temporary covenant until a better one came. The better one is now here. Jesus is the better and more perfect sacrifice for us. In verse 11, But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, who made the old tab who made the tabernacle in the Old Testament? Men. Men made it. Is it not a tabernacle not a tabernacle made with hands? That is to say, not of this building, neither by the the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having attained eternal redemption for us. I mean, look what Jesus did. Look what God did through Jesus for us. We weren't sh in the Old Testament. People asked for forgiveness, and they weren't sure if they were being forgiven, because sometimes that scapegoat came back. And if if they put the sins on the scapegoat, and the scapegoat came back, you still had your sin. <laughs> I mean, really. But just look how much better. And he said, "I'm gonna make a better covenant." Is this a better covenant? Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Now we can go into the Holy of Holies, not the high priest. Now we can go into the Holies of Holies, the house of God. Now we can. Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the Holies by the blood of Jesus. Because of Jesus and because we accept Him as our Lord, as our Savior, now we can enter into God's presence. Because that's what the Holies of Holies was. The priest would go in there and there would be smoke. But, but that, would be, that would be God showing His presence. But now, we don't need to be a high priest. Our high priest has done the sacrifice. Now we can go, right? It says right here, Having therefore, brethren, talking about Christians, boldness to enter into the holies by the blood of Jesus. Amen. And they could only do that once, once a year. We can come before Jesus as much as we want. Amen. Amen. Is this good or what? Is this a better covenant or what? Yeah, it's kind of makes me feel bad for the people back then. <laughs> <laughs> but they brought it on themselves. Yeah. They brought it on themselves. And we can bring it on ourselves too if we're not obedient to God's words. He's saying, this is what I have for you. This is for you. Be obedient to me. That's what he's saying. You be obedient to me and all this is for you. You, can, you walk with me. You can go and talk to my Father anytime you want. Amen. Amen. We were lost, wicked people, but because of what Jesus did, those who receive Him can go into God's presence. Not, not only can we go into His presence, but He says we can go into His presence in boldness. Right. In boldness. Why? Because He's our Father and we know He loves us. Yeah. He's not out to, to hurt us. If we get hurt, it's because we called it on ourselves. We did it to ourselves. God didn't do it. We're still wicked. And we're still very undeserving, right? Does anybody in here think they deserve salvation? I don't think so. But because of God's grace, we're forgiven. We're forgiven because of His grace. We're forgiven. He washes us clean when we let Him. He's got all this for us, but we have to let Him. He's given us our free will. Everybody's got a will. Yes, I'm going to turn to Jesus and let Him cleanse me. And let them take care of me. Or I have a free will. I can I'm gonna stay like I am. Now I'm not going to become a new creature. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. Because I like it. Even though it means I'm going to go to hell one day. But I'm having fun. And do you know how many people say that? I'm having fun right now. This is just temporary. Where we, This earth. Where we're at right now is just temporary. Either The Bible says it. Either you're going to live eternally in heaven with Jesus. Or... You're going to live, live eternally, everlasting, in a burning fire. So everybody's going to live forever. Everybody. The Lord make this, made this time right here for us to make a choice where we want to go. He's not making us go to hell, and He's not making us go to heaven. He's saying, I'm going to give you a free will. You choose where you want to go. This is just a temporary place where you're at right now. But you will live forever with me or with the devil. You make the choice now. And believe it or not, people have a hard time making that choice. Really? John, 
verse, uh, chapter 13. I'm going to start at verse 36, and I'm going to go all the way to chapter 14, verse 11. Jesus has told them that he was leaving. This is what Jesus is talking to the disciples. He tells them he's leaving in verse 33. And in verse 36, Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, You can't go with me now, but you will follow me later. Amen? Amen. Now he's speaking to the lost who didn't receive him as Lord. He tells them, he tells the lost people in John 8, 21. Now he's, what he just told the Christians is, Hey, I'm coming back for you. You can't go with me now, but I'm coming back for you. At John 8, 21. Later, Jesus said to them again, I'm going away. You will search for me, but will die in your sins. You cannot come where I'm going. Now this is the lost people he's talking to. He's not talking to Christians here. In verse 37, But why can't I come now, Lord? He asked. I'm ready to die for you. Many of us look at Peter as being a strong man of God. Because of what he said here. He said, I'm ready to die for you, Lord. And in Matthew 16, verses 15 through 18, this is Peter. He says unto them, But whom shall I say, whom, whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Flesh and blood didn't reveal it to him. What have, I, what have I told you before? Who draws you to the, to the Lord? The Holy Spirit does. The Father draws you. Not signs and wonders like some people want to see. They want to see a sign. They want to see miracles. No. The Bible plainly says you're drawn by the Holy Spirit. And that's why he says it right here. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. But my Father which is in heaven. The Holy Spirit. Verse 18. I say also unto thee. Thou, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now upon this rock, what are you saying? Upon this rock? He was saying on, on what you said, on that belief that you have, you're a rock. So any of us who believe like Peter did here, we're a rock. The Lord is the rock of our salvation, right? And then what he says in Luke 22, verse 33, and he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. This is Simon Peter now. He's saying all these things. Lord, I'm going to do this. I want to do that. I'm, you know, this is, It sounds like a mighty, mighty Christian man, right? He's willing to die. He's willing to go to prison. But let's see what Jesus says next. Verse 38. Jesus answered, Die for me? I tell you the truth, Peter. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times that you even know me. I mean, that's all I can do is shake my head. I pray that I'm not like Simon Peter. He said he would never deny Christ. But here he denies him three times. I don't want to be like Peter. Here we have a little girl. It's a little girl. It's not a soldier. It's not a king. It's a little girl. She says, you're one of them. You're one of the disciples. He looks at her like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know him. To a little girl. This mighty man of God who said, I will die for you. I will go to prison for you. He can't stand up to a little girl. Y'all hear me? There's many ways we deny knowing him. Not just this way. But there's many ways we deny knowing Christ. He was scared of a little girl. How many of us in here are scared to witness to people? To lost people. How many of us in here are scared to witness to people? Claiming that you know the Lord and you have what they need to get born again to make it to heaven. How many of us in here deny Christ that way? Don't say nothing. Don't raise your hands. It's a question for yourself. Are you denying Christ? Not only by not saying anything are you denying Him. But He says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, He says, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. So when we speak, when we do witness, we let the Lord take over our lips. We let the Lord speak. But how many of us do that? Think about it. We show it when we don't witness to others. We show it when we don't witness to others that our light is not shining. The Lord said what? That we're the light of the world, right? Mm -hmm. If you're denying Christ and you're not talking about Him, how's your light shining? Mm -hmm. That's a question for you. There's Christians who, who are in prison 
and there are and there are Christians. In fact, just the other day, what yesterday or the day before, what was forty four guys, Christian guys over there in ISIS or whatever that is over there. Forty one. Twenty one. Twenty one. Anyway, there's a lot beheaded because they were Christians. Do we have to fear this over here? Do we have to fear being beheaded for being a Christian? We don't have to fear that, but yet we act like. We act like that's going to happen to us because we don't tell people about Jesus. Are y'all hearing me? Mm-hmm. They're putting their life on the line being Christians over there. They're, they have to put their life on the line. Over here we don't. But we still don't tell people about, Christ, about, about the Lord. The servants of the devil, they're out there. They're out there on bikes. They're out there going door to door. The servants of the devil are doing a much better job than the God of people, than God's people. Think about that. I might be talking a little heavy tonight, but I need to. We need to. We need our Father, who just promised all these things to us. This, our Savior, who died on the cross for us. Can't we do this for Him? Just tell people. Just tell them. We don't have to die on the cross. We don't have to worry about be, being beheaded. Not yet. But uh, don't be surprised. It's probably coming to this country. I'm telling you now. But I wanna. I don't want to be like Peter and say, "Well, I'm never going to do that." Because Peter, I'm sure Peter was very sincere when he said, Lord, I'd go to prison for you. I would die for you. I'm sure he was very sincere about it. But when the time came, it didn't happen. So I don't want to be like that. I'm not gonna, I don't want to say I'm never going to do that. But I pray to God that I won't. I pray to God that I will stand strong with him. And the only Christians who are going to stand strong with him at that time are they going to be the Christians who are hungry for his words. It's going to be the Christian who's strong in the words. If you don't eat the bread of life, the words of God, are you going to be strong or weak? You're going to be weak. So how do you expect to be strong when that time comes if you hardly if you don't eat? You hear me? We better be strong in the Lord so we can stand when that time comes. Look at Stephen. They were they stoned him to death, but he he didn't stop preaching the word. He didn't stop speaking about Jesus. And he knew they were getting ready to storm to death, but he kept praising God. Amen? That's the way I want to be. I can say I'm that way, but I'm not going to know until the time comes. I just pray that I am that way. Just like I showed you before. We're going to go through trials and tribulation. The Lord said that. We're going to go through them. He said, don't be surprised when you do. Ain't that what he said? I've given you the scriptures before. He said, don't be surprised. I don't want to be like Peter. Apparently, Peter just wasn't strong. Enough to go through that trial or tribulation that he went through. I pray to God we are. I pray to God we are. We can be. Just because Peter couldn't do it, that doesn't mean we can't do it. Look at Stevens. Don't look at Peter. Look at Stevens. Stevens was stoned to death preaching the Word of God. That can be us. If we stay strong in the Lord and stay in His Word. Chapter 14, verse 1, to continue. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Oh my gosh, if people could only take that in. Ooh. Just think how much joy you would have in your life. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If there were, if it, if this were not so, would I have told you that I'm coming to prepare, to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me and where I am and you will know and you will know the way to where I am to where I'm going. But do you all hear that? Trust in God. Trust in me. He said, trust in me. Don't be troubled because you're not going to be here that long. I don't care if, I'm, if I live to be 120 years old, 120 years old, that's not long compared to eternity. Right? So if I'm going to be here 120 years, I can take whatever trouble comes my way. Not me, the Lord can. What I need to learn is how to give it to Him. Trust in Him. He's going to prepare a place for us. Nicole, God has gone to go prepare a place for you in heaven. Amen? This wheelchair that you're in, that's just temporary. You are going to live in heaven with no, no illness, no sickness, no wheelchair. Amen? Amen? Praise God. Well, anyway, this is why he told Peter earlier, you can't go with me now. You can't go with me now because i got to go prepare a place for you. Amen? Amen? It's like he tells me that and I know it and I believe it. I'm going to go, 
Okay, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Verse 5. No, we don't know, Lord, Thomas says. We have no idea where you're going. So how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Men of ourselves, we can't get to heaven. God said, I am the way. I am the way to heaven. Nothing we can do, just like in the Genesis, they built a tower to reach to heaven. Did they make it to heaven? No. God tore the port. In fact, He gave them different languages so they couldn't, be, they couldn't work together to make another way to heaven. God's, Jesus said, I am the way. I am the only way to heaven. And like I said before, our goodness is not going to get us there because we're so good. Nuh -uh. It's by God's grace. Do you know what grace means? Grace means He's given us something we don't deserve. Y'all hear me? We don't deserve it. God has given, his, given us His grace. Amazing grace, the song, that's amazing grace. To give us grace. To say, hey, you don't deserve it. You don't. But I'm giving you grace. God, amen. That Dahiki covenant that I was talking about, we have the Lord. We have the Lord. We're in covenant with God. The covenant, as far as that, as far as God being the Dahiki covenant with us, that's still, that's still the same. He's still our God. And like I said, He wants us to be people. He wants to be God. Meaning, He does everything. That's still in effect. It's just the sacrifices that changed. Verse 7. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. If we knew Jesus, we would know who the Father is. From now on, you do know Him and have seen Him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, now listen, Philip wants to see the Father. Jesus tells him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Not physical face, but when you see Jesus, you see the Father. You s the grace that the Father gives us, this is what Jesus has given. Give it, Jesus has given his life for us to receive grace from God. He says, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen? Amen. That's the way we should be also. That's the way. We, if you see us Christians as Christians, then you've seen Christ. Because that's what Christian is, right? Christian means Christ-like. So if people see the Christian in you, Listen to me. If Christian, if people see Christians in you, then they've seen Jesus the Christ. Amen? Amen. So he tells Philip, you still don't know who I am? Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me? Show him to you. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Isn't that what we do? Christians. Like me right now. God, Jesus, is working through me. I am His oracles. It's not me. It's not me at all. He's just using me. He's using me to speak to us. Amen? We can hear the, the Lord getting a little frustrated with Philip. He says, You have been with me all this time, and you just still don't know who I am. And Sorry, but that's us also. How long have we been Christian? I've been Christian for a long time. And sometimes I act like I don't know. Not that I'm, but I might get into a little problem. And I know I, I, I teach against it, but I forget who my father is. Instead of going to him because my head hurts, I go to the medicine cabinet. Get Advil. Y'all hear me? We can be Christians for a long time and we'll still forget who he is. By acts, by acts like that. Instead of going to him first, we'll do something else. So we're, we can't say too much about Philip here. Because in certain ways, we still do the same thing. But through this teaching, we learn, right? That doesn't mean we're going to keep doing it this way. Now we're learning, you know what? You're right. The Lord has shown me, I need to remember who my father is. So when I do get sick, I'm going to him first. Or whatever problem comes about, 
I'm going to Him first. I'm not going to try to take care of myself. Amen? Amen. This is the comparison of the two covenants. Okay, we're down to the end. This is the comparison of the two covenants. There was the first covenant, and then there was the second covenant, which was a better covenant, right? That's what God said. So let's compare. In the Old Testament, blood of animals. They had to sacrifice the animals, right? Leviticus chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. And the Lord called unto Moses and spoke unto him out of the tabernacle of the con congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, ye shall bring your offering of the cattle, or even of the herd, or of the flock. If his offering be burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it in his own voluntary will at the door of the tab tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And he shall put his hands upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. And he shall kill the bullock, bullock before the Lord, and the priest Aaron's son shall bring the blood and sprinkle it, the blood around about upon the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So I said all that to show Old Testament animal blood sacrifices. That was the Old Covenant. The New Covenant. The blood of Jesus. Hebrews 9.12 Neither by the blood of goats or calves, but by His own blood He entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So what He's saying here, it took one sacrifice. Old Testament, over and over. New Testament, the blood of Jesus was final. Was final. I would say that's better. Oh, yeah. Old Testament, animals were not enough. And again, they had to do all, the offering over and over. So in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 25, And he did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again. Talk about Jesus. He didn't enter heaven so he can sacrifice himself over again and again. Like the high priest here on earth who enters the most holy place year after year with the blood of animals. So you're showing right here, Jesus didn't have to do that like the, like the high priest. High priest had to do it over and over. Hebrews 10.4 For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Like I said before, that didn't take away their sins. In fact, when I teach on tabernacle, we're going to find it didn't take away their sins. It just covered them up. New Testament, Hebrews 10, 1 and 2. The old system under the laws of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year. But they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped. For the worshipers would have been purified once and for all time. And their feelings and guilt would, be, would have disappeared. So if those sacrifices could have done it, they would have done it. But Jesus was, was the final, the only, the final blood sacrifice. Old Testament, all the time, and didn't cover, and didn't cover, didn't, uh, Take away your sin. It just covered it. The New Testament, Jesus sacrificed one time and not all, it didn't cover our sin. The Lord forgave us our sins. Old Testament, it's just temporary cleansing. When they did cleansing, it was just temporary. Exodus 30.10 Once a year, Aaron must purify, purify the altar by swearing <clears throat> its horns with blood from the offering made to purify the people from their sin. This will be a regular this will be a regular annual event from generation to generation for this is the Lord's most holy altar. That was the Old Testament. Temporary. They had to do it regularly, year to year, from generation to generation. The New Testament our final cleansing. Romans six ten. When he died, he died once. To break the power of sin. Oh gosh. Amen. Amen. But now that he lives. He lives for the glory of God. Died once. Sacrificed once. 
to break the power of sin. Did, those, did the animal sacrifices do that? No. no. They weren't strong enough, and plus you had to do them over and over. God's new way of, of sacrificing was once, and we got forgiveness for sin. Amen. Amen. Now we know what testament means, right? So if anybody comes up to you and says, Hey, do you know what New Testament, Old Testament means? Oh, well sit down. <laughs> it's going to take a little while, but sit How down. <laughs> it's a covenant, an agreement that we make with God where He gives His life for us, does everything for us, and all we do is receive and be blessed. Amen. That's the new covenant. There's no better covenant on earth or in this universe where the God you have that you're in covenant with can do this. He does all the giving. We do all the receiving. Amen. Now, who wouldn't want to be in that kind of covenant? I don't even have the words to say what kind of covenant that is. <coughs> Jody, you can go to work tomorrow. You can sleep, sit down, eat, whatever you want to do. Your job, your, your work is going to take care of everything for you. All you got to do is show up and we're going to pay you. That's kind of what it is. That's kind of what it's like. God said, hey, you go in covenant with me, sit back, relax, and enjoy. Amen? <laughs> That's what it's like. Amen? Amen. <laughs> now we know what covenant is. Now we know what it means. Amen? Really? It's a blessing. I mean, after this teaching... We should, we, we should be walking around with a smile, face, a smile on our face already, but now that smile should be even bigger. I used to never smile. You, I mean, really, seriously, you can ask people in my past, is Jesse mad at me? No, that's just the way he is. He looks like a mean man. But now, I keep a smile on my face because I'm the scriptures that I read. Amen? How can we not have a smile on our, our face? There's so many things he said to us tonight in this teaching. Yeah. I'll just keep repeating myself because it's so good. I'll just keep <laughs> repeating it. But, amen.